Okay, hi, and welcome to Working In With Heights, potentially the only series dedicated to exercising your brain. Now, Heights, as you might have guessed, is all about brain health and mental well-being. We make smart, sustainable supplements that combine the essential oils and nutrients your brain and body need, and we deliver them through your letterbox every single month. We also create clever content in collaboration with the world's <coughs> leading experts to help you optimize your brain health and performance too, so you can reach your heights, whatever they might be. It's time to introduce today's mental fitness instructor, Dr. Tara Swartz. So hello, Tara. Hi, Dan. Thank you for having me back. I am a neuroscientist. I've got a PhD in neuropharmacology, and I also worked as a medical doctor specializing in psychiatry. So both the mental health and the sort of, you know, brain um, function side of things coming together. And um, after my career as a doctor, I moved into executive coaching. So I worked with a lot of CEOs. Um, I now have a handful of, of coaching clients. I do a few talks, but um, since my book came out and became a bestseller source, um, I mostly split my time between um, working with Heights as the chief science officer, lecturing at MIT and doing more book related stuff. As you know, I like to say the brain is the CEO of your body. Um, so obviously from my perspective, it's the most important organ, but therefore I say that if you live in, by my motto of brain, and our motto of brain first, then a lot of your other health issues fall into place. So if you're eating well for your brain, that's good for your gastrointestinal system. If you're exercising for your brain, that's good for your cardiovascular system. If you're staying hydrated for your brain, it's good for your kidneys and your renal system and your skin. Um, and being proactive about stress management. We all know about stress a lot more now, but I'm concerned about how many people are actually proactive about it and the implications of not doing that have what I call systemic consequences. So, you know, you, you sort of think of stress as a mental thing that may have like, you know, may affect your immune system, but actually affects your gut bacteria and your bone marrow, which is where all of your cells, your first line of defense come from. So it's just, it's an easier way to look after your general health by focusing on what's really good for your brain. Right. So brain health is wealth, essentially. Essentially, because, you know, we're all living longer now. We can beat several cancers. We can, you know, treat heart disease. But protecting our mental faculties as we age, I just think is, you know, it's either going to be a ticking time bomb or it's going to be one of the you know, greatest, most precious things we can do. So, you know, we understand the terms, you know, mental health and brain health, uh, you know, they, they seem like terms that we can get our heads around and engage in conversations. But sometimes you hear the word neuroscience and it does sound a bit othery, right? A bit scary. So, um, you know, as this is a masterclass in neuroscience, if you had, for example, 15 minutes to talk to us about what we need to know in neuroscience, what would you pick? How would you, how would you share your thoughts on it? One of the messages I want to get across today is, about doing all the small things that you can to keep your brain in peak condition, because they actually both accumulate to produce like, you know, bigger benefits, but also it's actually a fact that when you change a lifestyle behavior or you learn something new, because it's the brain that you're doing it for or doing it to, you get what's called global benefits in the brain. So for example, learning something can lead to better emotional regulation, even if it was a language that you were learning. So you get benefits that are greater than just the thing that you've learned. So I'd really like to start with the, the fundamentals, which are the physical things that keep the brain in good condition. And so the way I describe them is rest, fuel, hydrate, oxygenate, and simplify. But I've, for the purposes of today, I've sort of made the last one into meditate specifically and connect socially, because obviously, we've come off the back of being quite disconnected. Um, and I think many of us have seen how important that is, how it's affected us and our loved ones. So I think it's really worth sort of, you know, adding that in. And so in terms of if you're 25 to 65, then rest, fuel, hydrate, oxygenate and simplify are ways to keep your brain functioning well at the moment. But in terms of what I call resilient aging, that social connection piece becomes much more important as well. So rest is, is basically about sleep. It's not so much about so overnight sleep. It's not as much about napping or um, just recharging during the day. And so there's Nobel Science Prize winning research that told us more than we ever knew before about why we need to sleep. So 
For population norms, we need to sleep seven to nine hours a night. But the way to know what your number is, is if you naturally wake up at the weekend at the same time that you wake up during the week, then you're getting enough sleep. If you need to lie in or nap, or as some of my clients say, I could sleep all weekend if you let me, then you're not getting enough sleep. Um, so that's a good way to figure it out for yourself. So the and is it a good strategy? Is it a good strategy to try and catch up on sleep on the weekend? No. So if you need to, if you need to lie in or nap or, you know, go to bed early or just sleep a lot at the weekend, because that means that you're not getting enough sleep, um, you need to rectify, you know, what's happening during the week so that it's more evened out. But also because if you miss, you know, one night's good sleep or even one night's complete sleep here and there, that's not so bad. But if you go for four nights or more and accumulate what's called a sleep debt, then you can't actually do anything to make up for that. So um, one of the things that I, so I was talking to Joel, our co-founder, um, about a really nice way to talk about sleep, which is you can never be in credit with sleep. You can only be okay or in debt. So, you know, it's important to not say I went on holiday and slept 15 hours a night. So now I can, you know, work all hours and, and neglect my sleep kind of thing. Um, so during that seven to nine hours in bed, um, there's an eight hour cleansing process that occurs overnight, which is absolutely vital to cleaning out the toxins that build up during the day. And these are mainly from stress, alcohol, um, some processed or smoked foods, which we'll go into later. And just the, you know, just the general metabolism of the body and particularly as we age. So what we've seen is that this is a very active flushing out of toxins. It's not a passive trickling of fluid throughout the brain and spinal cord overnight. And that the actual toxins that are being flushed out are amyloid um, plaques and, and tangles and tau proteins, which are exactly the pathology that we see in um, diseases of aging like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. So if you chronically disrupt that process, then the potential implications for the age of onset of a dementia-like disease um, is that you're bringing that forward. So, you know, our brains are declining throughout age in ways that aren't noticeable to our day-to-day -day function. But when it hits a certain threshold, like a tipping point of neurons that have been destroyed, you would start to see cognitive deficits like memory problems. And um, if you're not sleeping su sufficient length and quality throughout most of your life, then that tipping point can come earlier. <clears throat> so that's sleep. That's sleep. So fuel, um, you know, we've got a whole section on nutrition, but that it's basically about nutrition. And I'll be talking about how the brain stores fuel which um, you know, sorts of fuels that particularly likes and why. Um, so I'll sort of skip over that now and go into hydration, which there is a segue because you actually get more hydration from eating hydrating foods than you do from just drinking water or even isotonic fluids. Um, so things like you know, water rich foods like cucumber and melon and you know, other fruits and vegetables, but we do need to drink water. Um, we need to drink about half a litre for every 15 kilos or 30 pounds of our body weight per day. Um, obviously it's not the same amount for you and I being quite different in size. Um, so it's good to work it out with that little formula. If you live in a really hot country or you do a lot of exercise or you drink a lot of alcohol or caffeine, then you, you should add to that to try to make up for the water loss that happens as a result of those things. Um, we know that if you're one to 3% dehydrated, that it actually impacts your focus and your memory and your concentration. And this is why there's been such a big movement to make sure that children have water in their school bags and things so that, you know, when they're in that very active time of learning that they're always hydrated. Um, and by the time you feel you're aware that you're thirsty or your lips are dry, you are way more than 3% dehydrated. So it's, it's definitely something you need to keep on top of. Um, oxygenation is about exercise, but I'm gonna to have to say with what I've seen in the last three or four months, you know, I've been doing a lot more mental health work than sort of brain optimization work, is that you need to breathe. I mean, oxygenation is about breathing and preferably breathing deeply or at least breathing mindfully. And in the last 13 years of, of working with executives, I've seen a lot of shallow breathing as a result of stress. But what I've seen in the last four months is a lot more breath holding, 
jaw clenching, teeth grinding, um, and of course, shallow breathing. So breath holding, you know, there's something that happens at night called sleep apnea, which is where you basically, you know, it might be for structural reasons, but sometimes it's a neurological reason that you, you don't breathe for a little while and then you wake up with a, you know, a great big snort sort of thing as you take in a big breath. We're seeing more cases of tech apnea now where people are looking at social media and it's such a stressful experience for the brain that they actually aren't, aren't aware that they're holding their breath whilst they're doing it. So, so just breathing is important, but then um, to get that extra oxygen flowing around the blood circulation in the brain and the body, aerobic exercise is probably the most obviously important form of exercise for the brain. Um, again, later when we talk about neuroplasticity, I'll talk about aerobic exercise and neurogenesis, which is growth of new brain cells. Um, but other forms of exercise, like whether it's weight bearing or whether it's social, they have differential effects around the brain in terms of brain benefits. So it's worth mixing up your exercise. And the recommendations are five to 10,000 steps per day and 150 minutes of aerobic exercise per week. So I've split the last two into meditate and connect socially. And I think a lot of people in the last four months, you know, being at home, having to do more things online, um, maybe needing to create some more boundaries between work and life have turned to meditation, which is a great thing. So, you know, it's definitely has become much more popular over the last 10 years, but I'm aware of more people turning to some of the apps or the practices themselves during this time. Um, and it's connected to the breath and it's also connected to reducing levels of the stress hormone cortisol to helping people, you know, if they had trouble sleeping um, and you know, it's something you can do as a family. So, that, so that's been a really good thing. There's lots of evidence that people who do some form of mindfulness three times a week have lower cortisol levels than age matched controls. So for example, women who do yoga three times a week are less stressed than women of the same age don't. And then the social connection piece, which I think you know, we've all had our journeys with over the last sort of four or five months. And um, you know, we're, I don't like the term hardwired because I believe we're capable of so much more than that, but you know, we're at least softwired to survive in, in clans and tribes. And so, you know, sort of through evolution, if we were isolated from that or um, cast out, <clears throat> that pretty much meant certain death. You didn't get the physical warmth that you might get from huddling together in a cave or sitting around a fire together. And you didn't get the emotional warmth of being part of a family and having physical affection. So um, I think that lockdown has highlighted how important that is for our brains. And like I said, I have had to deal with a lot more personal mental health issues and relationship mental health issues. And when I've tried to refer my clients or friends to um, relationship therapists, they are all absolutely working around the clock, can't take any more clients. So, you know, I think we've really seen the effects of social isolation properly for the first time. Yeah, it's really interesting because, you know, we talk about it inside the company as well, like the impact between um, obviously brain health, mental health, but also the social health, which is, you know, the, the right way, you know, we believe of, of discussing it, right, which is you need some kind of conversation about that, that level of importance of mm. um, communities and connecting with people outside of literally your four walls that you might have been isolated within and the yeah. impact that that can actually make on your sense of well-being and sense mm. of personal um, uh, like health and well-being in, in every kind of aspect. It's just like a, a complete and utter necessity. Yeah, I think I, I, like the, I, I like the way you've put it like that, like in terms of, you know, it's been highlight, it's been magnified what a necessity it is recently. I think with other events going on recently as well, it should also amplify the fact that we need to be listening to different perspectives. We need to be mingling with people that aren't the people we always hang around with and to think in the same way as us. So, you know, extending that social network to just bring in new perspectives and challenges and, you know, maybe speak in a different language or eat something you've never eaten before with someone, that, that's really important at the other end of the spectrum too. Um, so I'm going to make you do, um, well, actually, the last, the last one is simplify, is it not? Yeah, but I split simplify into, into meditate and connect socially. But what I usually Fair talk enough. about there is, is mindfulness and choice reduction, which is, um, you know, like a morning routine 
or just um, artificially reducing choices during the day to um, reduce distraction for the brain. But to be honest, in the last four or five months, that hasn't really been an issue because people have kind of been seeing the same thing and doing the same thing re repeatedly. So I, I switched it out for this. Yeah, fair enough. And I guess if you're you know, going out for a restaurant for the first time, don't choose an Italian restaurant with one of those giant menus that have everything on it because you know, no choice reduction there, just going to stress you out immediately.